We want to welcome all of you here and those that are actually watching us online. You do know that Nene just got a, a, a text from somebody in France that is watching the movement. So we want to welcome our sister from France as she is following us. I thought actually, you know, today was going to be less people, but praise the Lord that you're here. You don't want to deal with those crazy people on the road. I understand that. All right. Now, um, I've been telling you that for the past three weeks that it, you, you need to get, do yourself a favor and you need to get a hold of this book, The Coming of the Comforter by Leroy Froome. Okay? And I'm actually going to tell you what it is. And I, I, I gave uh, Sister Corinne and, 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 and Reggie an insight as to what was happening today. But listen to what it says. Actually, it gets a little bit into the sermon today. It says, the one thing they were told to do, meaning the disciples, was to wait. To do what? Wait, wait. Wait. For the coming of the promised spirit. How tragically hopeless everything would have been without the promised power. Then he says, no one is equipped for gospel service unless and until endued with this heavenly power. Knowledge is not enough. Listen, knowledge is not enough. Activity is not enough. One must have the power of the Holy Spirit. Not even was the authority to cast out demons sufficient. Those of you visiting today, welcome. Welcome back, Sister Sedona. Um, we have started this series on the Holy Spirit entitled Led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. How do you live in victory today and in the future as we live through the last days of earth's history? That's what we're dealing with. The title of my sermon was, is Cleansing Out Your Stuff, Part 2. Cleaning Out Your Stuff, Part two, there's more that God has to say about this issue of cleaning out. Today I'm praying that none of my professors in hermeneutics are actually watching my sermon. Because I'm going to begin in a way that they would not expect. But the text we just read illustrates how in our life we pile up stuff. What do we do? Pile up stuff. My wife, would, my, my, my wife will tell you that we have a custom of walking around the house at the end of the year and then also in the middle of the year. And we notice areas that used to have space but now don't have any space. Have you been? Some of us pray that someone... Uh, in your house, do not open that door that you want to maintain closed. Because if they do, they will see how much stuff we have piled up. Can anyone relate? Yeah. I mean, I remember last year, you know, Sister Sedona and Nanette asked us to bring our coats, our sweaters, our socks to donate to the homeless. And I remember that we went to our house and I know it is embarrassing to say, but you know, I'm just going to use today's sermon for confession. <laughs> because I'm cleaning out my stuff even while I'm preaching out this morning because we don't realize how much over the years we pile up stuff. And one would think that the net is the shopper at home. No, sir. I am. 
you're walking through the outlets and you see a nice suit, shirt, stripes, white, gray, black, you pick one up. Now granted, I already have 20 other dress, dress shirts at home. So last year, when we were looking for things, you know, to give to the homeless, I was arguing with myself because I did not realize that a certain shirt or coat was in my closet and I didn't know about it. Totally crazy. So I ended up giving away the coat, shirts, sweaters. But that's not the shame of it all. The shame of it was how many coats and shirts and sweaters I still had left. And my mind says, whence cometh, you know, you, you get so disturbed with yourself, you start using KJV language. <laughs> whence cometh all these clothes? And I need you to stay with me because I'm, 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 I'm getting you set up for something. Piling up stuff. You know, some of us have dresses that have not seen the light of day for years. Come on, say amen. amen. Because you need to cleanse out too. It's not only Mario cleaning out. Some of us, our shoe collection. <laughs> See, somebody's letting it go right now. And if you're like me, I was going through my clothes and I said, just in case. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I need this sweater, even though I have nothing in my closet that matches with the sweater, but just in case. Maybe I'll buy some slacks that will go with this sweater or with this shirt, and you keep it and stays in the closet for five more years. Does anybody know what I'm talking about now? And anybody here who has ever moved like Nenette and I did almost two years ago, you know that we're telling the truth now. You are shocked at the things that you piled up. And of course, my things is computers. You know, Daryl knows what I'm talking about. And I like to try new things. I build my own computers. And every other week, there's some technology-related hardware arriving at home. And I know that Sister Nanette will have remarks to make. So, so, so I come up with some kind of excuse on how I'm going to use this technology for the betterment of humanity. <laughs> Stuff. See, what I'm trying to tell you is that we accumulate and identify ourselves with things. Much of what we do in our life is piling up. We pile up. There are a number of things that you are hooked up with or to that are part of your regular life that if they left tomorrow, you'll be just fine. Think about it. Let me get close right now, you know, because you guys are too pious for me now. Something common to everybody. Do you realize that you would not lose anything or you would not miss anything meaningful if you did not have a television? Now some of you just had a heart attack. I need you to think about the stuff that you accumulate. Because over the years, remember, we're talking about, about being led by the Spirit. And over the years, we get psychologically attracted to stuff and make the decision that something is necessary when it's really not. And I believe that there has to be a reason why the Bible keeps talking about God's people going through trials in the last days and coming down to just bread and water. Why does the Bible say that? See, God must have decided somewhere along the way that most things we think are important are not necessary at all. There was a wise man. His name was Solomon. 
And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, this man helps me preach today's sermon about cleaning out your stuff. He is eloquent in describing the accumulation of the unnecessary. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 12, and I need all of you to read it with your Bibles, but, 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 but you need to find it because I'm going to read from the New English Bible, and unless you know, you're, you're giving, you know, your study is very difficult Bible to find, by the way, unless you find it online. It was, in fact, the first Bible in the New Modern Language. It was actually uh, written in the 1960s. But Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the New English Bible, not to be confused with the New English translation. And then uh, I'm going to start in, in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, and then I'm going to jump into chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 from the NEB. Now listen to how Solomon is talking to us right now. Talking in modern, to modern people. Okay, I'm going to read it. It says, I speak, I the speaker, ruled as king over Israel and Jerusalem. Verse 13. I applied, I applied, you got that? I apply my mind to study and explore all that is done under heaven. Solomon said, I want to look at all, all that humanity, all human activity, excuse me, and see how much of it is meaningful. Now, chapter 2 and verse 1. I said to myself, come, I will plunge into pleasures and enjoy myself, but this too was emptiness. Depending on your translation, some of your translation says vanity. Verse 2, of laughter I said, it is madness, and of pleasure, what is the good of that? Verse 3, so I sought to stimulate myself with wine in the hope of finding out what was good for men to do under heaven throughout the brief span of their lives. So now, this powerful statement, you know, it, 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 this powerful t statement is made by Solomon. Because friends, I need you to listen to me because we're talking about cleaning out your stuff. And what some of us do not understand is that life is too short. And some of us, for some of us, life is shorter than short. Many people in this room and, and that you know will never see their 60th birthday. And the question comes, how important is what you're doing? What is the good of what you're doing? Is it worth it? How lasting and eternal is it? Solomon continues in verse 4, I undertook great works. I built myself houses and planted vineyards. So, so you know that there's nothing like buying a new house. Right? Yeah, confession. It gives you a certain feeling. I own a piece of land. And there's certain pride. I just feel like, you know, again, like confessing my sins today. You're, you're filled out an application. It says rent or own. And with a certain amount of enthusiasm, you check own. And you feel separated from all the rest of humanity. Own, not rent, own. I'm not trying to make people fat, you know, bad who, who are renting, but it's a thing. Own. And even the people in the bank treat you differently, right? Yeah. Now, just in case you did not know, you really don't own that house. You'll never own the house. Even when you make the last payment on the house, go ahead and miss the tax payment, and you will quickly realize who owned the house. But psychologically, huh? The, the, the psychological high is there. So Solomon is saying to himself, I build houses. I plant vineyards, verse 5, I made myself gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. 
I made myself pools of water to irrigate a grove of growing trees. I bought slaves, male and female. I had, I had my house, my, my home born slave as well. I have possessions, more cattle and flocks than any of my predecessors in Jerusalem. I amazed silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired singers, men and women, and all that men delights in. I was great, greater than all my predecessors, verse 9, in Jerusalem. And my wisdom stood me in good stead. Verse 10, whatever my eyes coveted, I refused them nothing. Nor did I deny myself any pleasure. Yes, indeed, I got pleasure, it says, from all my labor. From all my labor, this was my reward. Verse 11, then I turn and review all of my handiwork, all of my labor and toil, and I saw that everything was emptiness. Everything was what? And chasing the wind of no profit under the sun. Help of Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Very few of us will ever live the life that Solomon lived. In fact, very few of us will ever know the kind of material abundance that he had. Yet th his description of life is not as far from us as we might like to think of at first, at the fir as first glance. You see, what Solomon is saying is that over a lifetime, his house got full, and he questions the profit of it. And I want to address that today because in the book of Acts, it deals with this issue in Acts 1 and verse 14. We got to go over that, over that specific uh, verse of scripture one more time. Go to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to stay in the book of Acts for the remainder. And then we're going to jump into the book of John because the, we're going to piggyback on last week's sermon. Acts 1 14. The, the, this, this was the challenge brought before the church as it began its Christian journey. And it was the challenge. God brought to me this week about cleaning out stuff. Acts 1 and verse 14. Are you there? Just two of you. Are you there? All right, let's read it together. It says, These all continued with one accord in prayer. And what else? Again, I want you to get the picture. We, we have 11 disciples. They're all listed there. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, had accumulated stuff in her spiritual house. And then the brothers of Jesus, who at one time did not believe in him, be, but, not, but, but now became believers, all of these holy people, the founders of the Christian church, all these apostles had stuff in their house. In fact, you can sense how bad this stuff was inside their spiritual house, all you got to do is go back and read verse 6. Read it. It says this, Acts 1 and verse 6. He says, therefore, when they, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when they had come together, they asked them saying, Lord, with you at the, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus has gone through all this time, three and a half years, telling, telling them, my kingdom is not of this world. He goes to the cross. He is crucified. He died for the sins of man. He died for man's twisted priorities. And then when he comes up out of the grave, having, having, having visited the planet for about 50 days, they still want their agenda to be filled. Will we get our kingdom now? And Jesus says, no. Go somewhere and clean out your stuff first. 
going away. You, your mind is still filled with the stuff of this planet. Your aims are still earthly. Now, it, it is not for you to know, he says, the times and seasons. That belongs to my father, he says. And in the meantime, you're going to receive power. Why? Because the Holy Ghost that you already received at conversion and in truth has not done enough for you. You need more power to get your junk out of your life. And I told you last Sabbath, and I'm going to say it again. Whatever Holy Ghost power you have now will not be sufficient to get you through the time of trouble. And we proved that last, last week with our Bibles. You have the Holy Spirit even now. He came when you found the truth. Every time you do something decent, there is proof that the Holy Spirit is in you. But friends, I don't know if you are noticing, but it is getting ready to get really rough in this place. I, I'm going to say it again. It's getting ready to get really rough in this planet. And all I hear from people inside and outside the church is, oh, we're getting back to normal. No, we're not. We are going through birth pains. What is happening right now are contractions. We went through, look at how we are. We went through almost two years of lockdown, and some of you were getting ready to go crazy. Christians who know the truth. Christians who have been taught about the signs of the end. Christians who are supposed to reflect Christ. Two years! And Jesus said, when you see all these things happening, look up! For your salvation draws near. Did you look up? Or were you moaning and groaning like those who have no hope? You see, what this pandemic has actually demonstrated is that you still have too much of you inside of you. Newsflash, this is only the beginning. This is just getting started. But those who are filled with the Holy Spirit at the end, those whose lives are led by the Spirit will be victorious. And God is not going to drop power on people who do not use power they already have. So here we find the founders of the Christian church still wanting the kingdom. And Jesus says, no, -uh, mm -mm. go Terry, go wait, go get some things out of your life, out of your heart, out of your brain, out of your desires, out of your aims. Some of you sitting in this church right now and watching online are still praying for prayers God cannot answer. So they went to the upper room. And we learned in our first sermon that any place the Holy Spirit is there, is, it, 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 you know, is there, what happens in that place? There is what? Uh-oh, action, okay? No, you, 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 you took too long. Action. There is what? Action. So let's review because some of you did not answer that question with confidence. All right? Acts 2 and verse 4. Go there. This is what it says. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Remember that? Yeah. Pentecost. Go to verse 46. Verse 46 of Acts 2. He says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. You see that? They received the spirit and began to go from house to house ministering. We're about to do that. Go to Acts 4. Come on. Acts 4. He says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. You see that? He starts speaking boldly to the leaders. Now, this is the same guy that denied the Lord. Do you see what a difference extra power makes? 
Because when extra power comes, you don't stay the same. You're not a coward anymore. Verse 31 is more. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. You see that? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, Acts 6. Go to Acts 6. Yeah. Acts 6. I'm just giving you some examples of what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. Acts 6, verse 5. You know, they, 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 they're about to actually choose some deacons, right? In Acts 6 and verse 5, it says this. And they say, and please with the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and what? Holy the Holy Spirit. And he tells you all the deacons that they selected, even Nicholas from Antioch, right? And then in verse 6, it says, whom they set before the apostles, and when they have prayed, they laid hands on them. Verse 7. Look at what happens when the Holy Spirit comes with power. Then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiply greatly. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit came and the clerk could not even send out a number. Just greatly. The Holy Spirit is associated, what I'm trying to prove here, is that the Holy Spirit is associated with action. Action. The Holy Spirit is associated with action. Action. So when there's no promise of action, the Holy Spirit will not manifest himself. In your life or mine, if there's no action right now, why will he manifest himself with more? You know, people who just come to church and then go home and don't do anything for Jesus Christ will not receive the latter rain. There, I said it. Because you have already proven that you won't use the power you already have. Why would God give you more? And this is why your pastor is so excited about the upcoming training. Because it is less excuse to sit down. Lord, please bless those people right now. It is less opportunity for you to say that you did not know what you were doing. We're talking, we're taking away all the excuses that for you, and you have to get involved. You got to join some of the team, some team. You have to feel that energy that says God has been good to me and I cannot sit on it any longer. You know, we, we, we have to become more aggressive. There, I said it. Uh, you know, really, really inviting people to church. Say to someone, you know, we're talking about the Holy Spirit and I would like for you to come. Oh, but Mario, they said no before. Leave God's word for God. Just be an instrument. Stop trying to unthink, you know, outthink God. You know, well, I, I asked my friends and my loved ones and my wife, and they said no before. Ask them again. Because power means action. Power means what? Action. Yeah. So, so we have this pattern when, they, when the Holy Spirit comes. And Jesus in Acts 1, verse 8, he promises the power. Now, let's go back to John. John. John 14. John 14. Mm. That's why I tell you, you need to bring your Bibles, folks. Because you need to read these verses for yourself. John 14, verse 16 and 18. If you don't have one, let me know. We'll give you one. All right? Uh, you know, there was a lot more God needed to say from last week. I, just, I was just hungry. So, it, I, I'm just sharing what he shared with me. Watch me, watch me. He says, this is one of my favorite, uh, you know, verses of scripture. John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father. Stop. You do know that there's only six texts in the Bible where Jesus says that he's going to pray for you. 
This is one of them. You cannot read this too fast. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he might abide with you how long? And we mentioned last Sabbath that this verse is telling you that there's also a, there's already a comforter. We have two. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Double comfort for the time of trouble. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. This goes to show you how bad things are going to get. God says, I cannot leave my people with one comforter in the last days. They're going to need two. Why? Because it's going to get rough. And that's why when you cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, this text says to you, there's going to be plenty of mercy. Amen. The Holy Ghost and Jesus will come to your rescue. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, because some of this stuff, like the pandemic, will drive you out of your mind. But what you need to understand is that losses in Jesus are gains. Okay. The fact is, we're not willing to let go. It's because we don't believe that. Do you know that we serve a God that adds by subtracting? Do, do you know that we serve a God that multiplies by dividing? Look at the breads and the fish and the bread. <laughs> what we consider losses are gains in the name of Jesus. You know, I lost my mother and all of my grandparents. But on Resurrection Day, I'm expecting to see them again. But you have to understand that during the time when it seems like you are losing everything, when it seems like a loss, you have a comfort. You're not left by yourself. Amen. Look at verse 17. The spirit of truth, in case you know who I'm who talking about, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he dwells with you and will be what? In you. In you. This is why we have to have confidence walking through this world because you have something other, others do not have. So the stuff doesn't accept you, doesn't upset you like it does everybody else. Or should I say, should not upset you like everybody else. Because God has already prepared you for it. And because of that preparation, you have something they don't have. Do you really think that God did not have a reason for me to preach both the book of Daniel and Revelation for a whole year back to back? Do you think that was a coincidence? No. Now you have something other people do not have. Or may I should ask the question, do you have something that they don't have? Do you have peace and confidence? Are you steady and ready? Do you know that when you need, when you need bread, bread will come? When you need your bills paid, they will be paid. Do you believe that God is able? See, God never changes his mind about his church. But Jesus says, they don't know him. And then in verse 18, it says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And I said last week that that's the reason why Jesus says in Matthew 28 that I will be with you always. God is with you even when you're hurting. And it gives me great pleasure, you know, and great peace to recognize that even when I don't feel like praying, the Holy Ghost is still stays close to me. I'm talking about the promises of, of Romans 8, verse 26. Because sometimes you feel so low that you cannot even do, you know, moan. And the Lord Jesus Christ with the Spirit takes your moan 
and makes it a request for what you need. That's what Romans 8 says. It says the spirit intercedes for me with groanings which cannot be uttered. By the way, that goes to tell you that nobody can talk the way that the Holy Spirit can talk. That's one of the texts, the proof texts. I have the Holy Spirit language, but the Bible just told you that no one can utter that. It's just a preview of speaking in tongues. I'm not going to get into it now. My point is that the Holy Ghost can translate your moans. So Jesus says to the eleven, go somewhere and wait. Go somewhere and tarry. And I don't know whether you ever noticed or not, but serious house cleaning takes time. I'm talking about serious house cleaning. You know, I was taught to clean house by my mother. Cleaning underneath the stove. Mom, who in the world is going to look down there? Nobody knows that it's dirty over there, down there. I do. And on Saturdays, that was cleaning day in my house. And if I did not do my cleaning, my cleaning chores, you know, that day, guess who was not actually going out with his friends that night? She taught me to pay attention to what I was doing. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that meant the real, that, that real cleaning takes a lot of time. Now, I need, I, I, I need you here and at home to listen to me right now because some of you have let too much stuff piled up. And you need to start cleaning your stuff today. You know, there, 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 there is stuff in your life, stuff in your soul, that has become part of who you are. And you don't realize, even as you're listening to me, how damaged you really are. You just know that you don't feel right. You just know that you don't have peace in your life. You just know that you're not saved yet. You know it. You know it in your gut. And there are things going on in some of your lives that used to alarm you, now just kind of bothers you. That's a sign that, cle that cleaning needs to take place. And my mother taught me that to clean, you have to move furniture around. Are you listening? You got to move some things. And when you move things, you find things that have been sitting there for a long time. Have you ever pulled up the pillows on your sofa? The stuff that you find when you look under the cushions of your sofa? But the problem is that we have, that, 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 that we have is, is that some of us have actually, is that we have decided that some of our sins are acceptable to God. Oh, it's going to be saved. God understands. He understands that you need to pick up your cushions from your sofa and get the vacuum cleaner. You see, the kind of cleaning the disciples were doing was something else. They came together with prayer and supplication. That means they spent time. They were tearing and talking and apologizing and reasoning, begging God for help. It scared them when they realized the kind of condition they were in. And God is going to start the church with us? We're not ready. And I could hear them in the upper room saying, we're not ready. And I got to tell you, you know, I got to tell you, you guys are like my family. My heart is bleeding for all of us right now. Most of our members in this church are not ready for the last days. We're not ready. Because the tearing and the lingering and the cleaning out of our stuff and the spending time with God that is necessary is not going on in this church. You know how I know? Where are the visitors brought by you? Where are, the, where are you during prayer meeting? 
Where are you during Wednesday Bible study? The reason we're not participating or doing any of those things is because you are too comfortable with the here and now. And that is not going to save one soul in this pews. You got to clean out your stuff. We have to be filled up. You know, we, we have more money in the bank that most churches have, you know, have in their banks that have been in existence longer than we have. Unfortunately, you cannot tithe and offering your way into the kingdom. Oh, no, sure, we're happy. Some of, some of you are impressed. The conference is happy getting that check. Huh? But we only baptized six people. They went about a Sabbath day journey. They have been with Jesus and they seen him go up to heaven. I mean, and that must have been awesome. I mean, like clouds lifted him up. Angels are there. Well, why you stand there gazing up to heaven, man of Galilee? The same Jesus, which you have, which has been taken up into heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. Now go. And clean out your stuff. He's going to come back. And like I told you last Sabbath, I can just imagine the walk. Because like I told you last Sabbath, you see Mount Olivet is just outside Jerusalem. And we mentioned that Olivet is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. And I told you last Sabbath, but I did not finish my thoughts. As they were walking back, they got to Gethsemane. And they were reminded that Gethsemane was the moment, their moment of shame. So on the way to clean your stuff out, you have to walk by your shame. Before God can trust you with more power, you must acknowledge your shame. And some of us are ashamed of others finding out our shame, but not ashamed that we did it. Because these disciples were reminded, you cannot beg for more power until you realize how low you have been. And when they walked by the garden, they remember how they all forsook him and fled. Suddenly they recognized we have got to get to the upper room. We're not ready for what is ahead of us. We could not even handle the crucifixion, let alone starting a church. Lord, have mercy on us. We've got to hurry up. But the trip is not done yet for them. They walked toward Jerusalem, and they could see Golgotha's hill. And they could see the tree that Judas used to hang himself. You see, they, they, they already suffer losses amongst them. And, and they walk by and they realize how, how, how low they sunk. We became betrayers. We became deniers. We became cowards. We have to get to the upper room. We're carrying too much stuff. We're not ready. And that's why I tell my students, don't worry if God takes you through your shame. If God reminds you of where you have been, don't worry. God is just getting you ready. The darkest hour comes before the dawn. And he may remind you of how low you fell so you know how high you can go. We mentioned last Sabbath that a Sabbath day journey is three-fourths of a mile. And by the time they got to the room, I pictured them running up the steps, falling to their knees. Lord, help us! How shall we stand in this great day? Because we said last Sabbath that if it took extra power to start the church, what is going to be like and how much power do you need when this is all over? 
Because any ministry in this church that is just about having stuff for us is an insult to the Holy Spirit. If a ministry doesn't involve us reaching out, because if you notice, they went to the room, they got the power, and then they went out to other people. Because God's power cannot be contained in the church. It needs to be out there. And when God's power is contained and kept in the church, it kills the members. And this is the part that I want to get into. You see, when someone mentions being led by the Spirit, all of us say, Amen. But what we don't dare to say Amen to is the fact that all of us have stuff we don't want other people to see. Some of us would not want the pastor to see our Netflix and Prime Video collection, but the Holy Ghost sees it. Some of us would not want other folks in the church to see the list of calls that we make on our cell phone, but the Holy Ghost sees it. Isn't it funny how we are? We get all wrapped up worrying about people who are hell-bound and not worry about the God that can take you to heaven. We go out of our way to appear righteous before people, but we forget that the Holy Spirit, the real house leader. Thank God that when Jesus comes in to help me, I don't have to hide anything. He already knows what is there. You see, I titled my sermon, Cleaning Out Your Stuff. And some of you, uh, you know, some of you were, were, were already thinking about what you needed to do. About the things that you needed to change. It's not about you cleaning up. It's about giving Jesus permission to clean your stuff out of his way. And when he's done cleaning, some stuff that you like won't be there. Hallelujah! Because he cleans with authority. And guess what? He's going to move some stuff out. Some of us have addresses and telephone numbers that we need to delete. Because relationships, listen... Relationships are going to kill more Christians than anything I know. And I'm just going to pause there and let, let, you, let, you, let that sink in. And guess what? Nobody's worth going to hell for. And at some point, you just have to decide to disconnect. Oh, but pastor, they are disconnect. But they made me feel disconnect. But it will be so lonely, disconnect. Think about it. You end up in hell, burning for your sins, and this person is right there beside you. Now you have their company. Together, burning in hell. You couldn't live without them. Now you're dying with them. You know, I have decided that by myself in heaven is better than companionship in hell. Amen. My mother used to say, it is better to walk alone than with bad company. Because in heaven, Jesus is, is going to clean your house. Jesus said in Revelation, he said, I'm going to wipe away all tears from your eyes. And Jesus is going to do such cleanup for a thousand years that you're not going to remember that person you could not live without. I know it's hard to say amen. I know you're trying to say amen. Mm -mm -mm. You're supposed to say amen, but you know that what I'm telling you is true. Amen. Because one of the hardest things in life to do is end a relationship. But it is part of cleaning out your stuff. So they got to the upper room, and they requested their Lord to hear them. He's their advocate in heaven now. Truth that they heard from his mouth were brought back to their minds. 
They're meditating on his life. They remember how they treated him when they, they had him for three and a half years. They, 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 they put away their differences in supremacy. They drew nearer to God. They searched their hearts. Their felt spiritual need. And when they finished, at first it was quiet. And we're told like, like a little breeze blowing through the room and then it got stronger. And I don't know what kind of curtains they had back then, but whatever they had, they began to move slowly. And then the Bible says, like, like a mighty rushing wind. The Holy Ghost came slowly at first, like a whisper, and then it began to rush in because he's so powerful. He's the third person of the Godhead. He is God himself. He is the creator just like God, the, the Father. Remember in Genesis says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. He's all power. Unleash, untame power he is. And suddenly the building began to shake. And the wind began to blow. And finally, the Holy Ghost could not contain himself and manifested himself in tongues of fire. And ignorant men were given PhD in languages in a second. They began to speak with tongues or languages that, that, of all the people around them. In Acts 2, it actually names 11 different languages that they learned in five seconds. You know why? Because they cleaned out their stuff. Amen. You cannot take power until you get your junk out. Amen. But you have to decide. Nobody can decide for you. You have to decide. You cannot keep making excuses for yourself. You have to decide. You need to be clean. So at the end of his life, Solomon finally got it. Mario, I tried everything. And here's the conclusion of the whole matter, Mario. What is it, Solomon? Because you had it all, man. What is it? What was it? Your stocks and bonds? Was it your houses with all these thousand women? No, Mario. It wasn't that at all. Fear God. And keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Seriously, Solomon? Yes. Because when you allow Jesus to clean out your stuff, you can keep stuff worth keeping. And the more I think about the days we are living, I don't want any person I pastor in this church to be lost. Perhaps I'm a foolish person and optimistic enough to believe that that is possible. But not one person who is a member of the movement, visiting or not, I said not one person needs to be lost. But you got to make a decision yes. to clean out your stuff. Yes. And to do that, you're going to have to allow and give authority to Jesus to take it out. Amen. And that's my call this morning. Very simple one. Very simple. Will you right now let go of your past. Let go of some relationships. Let go of anything that is keeping you from having that relationship with Jesus, which will lead you to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Would you give Jesus permission to take it away? To move it out of the way so you can have room room for the Holy Spirit power your heads are bowed 
Your eyes are closed. Father, not an easy sermon for me. Sometimes Mario is too full of Mario. And yesterday, you used my wife to say, stop depending on you and depend on Jesus. He will get it done. And when I removed myself, Jesus did it. So I'm not preaching to my congregation. I'm preaching to myself. But maybe, Lord, there is somebody with this issue right now. Too much of them. Too much of something that needs to be moved out. And perhaps they're too weak to let it go. They're too weak. They cannot even move it out of, the, out of this way. The Bible says that where we are weak, you are strong. So right now as I pause this prayer, is there anything in your life that needs to be cleaned out? Anything. that you want to say to Jesus, Lord, I don't have the strength to get rid of it. If you want to give Jesus permission, to take it out of your life, stand to your feet right now. Only if you have something in your life that you need Jesus' help to take it out so that we can finally make room for the Holy Spirit. Lord, you see you're standing. It's not an easy call. I'm standing with your people because there are things that we need to let go of. And right now we're standing because we're too weak to do it ourselves. So Jesus, take it. Move it. Move it out. And Holy Spirit, where there seems to be a gap, in emptiness because we move that stuff out. Holy Spirit, come and dwell in there. We are intentionally inviting you, Holy Spirit, into our lives. We need your power. We want your power. Because without it, we cannot make it. And we all want to make it. So right now, Father, whatever it is, I'm going to take about 20 seconds and I need you to pray silently there and ask, the, ask Jesus to move that out of this place. Right now, in the quietness right there, make that prayer right now. You at home, you can do the same thing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for answering. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated.